Hey everybody, welcome back. We got a special edition of Up North Journal podcast for you tonight, folks. We got Ken Sakluna. Ken, what's going on? You're down on the boat dock. Down on the down on the, the boat dock tonight, and uh, excited to be here. Excited to talk some fishing. It's uh, it's that time of year where things are ramping up, and uh, this is uh, what I'd love to be doing tonight. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to get a, a quick share out of the way, and then we will get rolling along. I know. Uh, Danny's going to handle it uh, on the other end. Dan DeFall is not with us tonight, but he will be hanging out with us and uh, monitoring the, the actual live stream. So if you got questions, he'll, he'll be feeding us some questions along the way here. And if my phone will play nice here, we'll get going. And do let's see. <clears throat> Always takes a second for this thing to catch up. Do you see the feed on your end yet, Ken? Uh, yeah. Okay, good deal. Yep. All right. I see a few people yeah, already piling in way. the cabin tonight. Good deal. Okay. Yep, Dan's on with us. Danny, if you can hear us, say hello. Wave to us. Do something there from your end. And... Okay, I've got my share done. Mr. Genzel is in the house with us tonight. Mr. Tom. What is going on, my man? All right. Uh, are you ready on your end, Ken? Or yeah, you, uh, I'm, I'm good to go. I got one more share to do, and I'm good to go. Okay, well, while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I will go ahead and get uh, some of the business taken care of on our end. Here we go. Stand by. And in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Edmund Journal Podcast, everybody. I'm host, Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight. we got Ken Seclune, a special guest, sitting in. And the UNJ boat dock. How's you got your toe in the water down there? How's the water? Yeah, it's uh, yep. Yeah, just got it in there. Just getting warmed up, and uh, hopefully be diving in here in a second. Uh, all right, good deal. Well, I tell you what, <laughs> let's take care of some quick business here while uh, we're we're getting things started here. And yeah. you know, as always, uh, we got Hunter's Blend Coffee, and we'd love to be able to share a special promo code with you, UNJ. If you type the UNJ promo code in it. Huntersblendcoffee.com. You'll save 20% on your order. You know, Hunters Blend has been very good to us. And uh, if you'd uh, go over there and help out somebody who supports us, if you'd support them, everybody wins. So go over and check them out. And also, we've got a, a promo code, the Up North Journal promo code, over at BuckBaits.com. If you go over there and check them out, you can save 20% on your order. You know, and everybody says, "Well, it's not hunting season yet." Well, you know what? They've got more than just just stuff for hunting season. You know, so go over and check it out. They got a lot of new products in their showcase. So go over and take a quick look, and save yourself 20% by using that Up North Journal promo code. And we had them on last week, Rebel 6 Rubs, right here in Michigan, another Michigan company. If you use the North Journal promo code, you can go over there and you can save 20% on your order over there as well. And we've got one more to go here, and that is Trips for Trade. If you go to Trips number four trade.com you can save 20 percent over there if you use up north 20 over there and you can trade hunts and trips back and forth it's a way for hunters fishermen outdoors people to get together and share different experiences and, and swap some hunts that way so that's all good stuff right there all right ken we've got that out of the way uh you've kind of put this together for us tonight so uh, i'm just going to go ahead and i'm going to let you take control of the show here and go ahead and introduce our guests and get started Okay, yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to bring the show to the Up North Journal crowd tonight. Uh, our guest tonight is Marcel Veenstra. Uh, this is a guy um, that I've been wanting to talk to uh, for a very long time. He's a well-known uh, bass fisherman here um, in Michigan, but all around the country, really. Uh, he's one of the top guides there is, in my opinion, and uh, Marcel's here with us tonight. Marcel, thanks for being here. How are you tonight? I'm doing great, buddy. Hey, Ken, Mike, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm really glad to be here. want to talk a little bit of fishing tonight, so I'm ready, man. Yeah, it's all good because, uh, you know, the big furry slipper has been taken off when we put boats in the water. So yep. <laughs> I think everybody's ready. I know Ken's been chopping at the bit. Ken, did you not do a little fishing today? I did do a little fishing today. I shot up to uh, Gladwin and got a little fishing in, and uh, it's it's nice, just a quick trip. We caught, you know, I caught a lot of good ones, and uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. It was a good day to get out. And maybe I'll sneak out tomorrow night too. But uh, so Marcel, you know, you know, Mike alluded to it before we dive in. I mean, 
how, how have you been uh, uh, dealing with this whole crisis? I mean, how, how bad? I mean, are you are you booked out through all the summer? Is there any openings left? I mean, how's it how's it affected you? Well, I mean, as far as myself, I had been pretty much, I would say, about eighty five percent booked going in. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, the COVID problem has maybe altered things a little bit. Has thrown a few cancellations because I have some clients that are a little older. They were a little bit more uh, suspect of getting something, so they kind of yeah. bailed out. And you know, but there's other people that'll pick it up no problem. Um, throughout the year, I pretty much will be booked every single day that I want to be booked, which is usually going to be six out of seven days. And then I got five great guides. They all work with me. We're all a team. Um, they don't work for me, but you know, where they work with me as a team, we communicate. And what I do is once I'm booked totally, I just, you know, I'll move, uh, some of my new clientele over to those guys and mm -hmm. they'll, you know, they'll do an awesome trip also. Good. Um, how can you just kind of give us a, a just a, a brief introduction who you are and how you got to this point uh, where you're guiding full time for a living here on, on Lake St. Clair in Michigan? Well, really what happened is um, I'm, I'm originally from the East Coast. I moved to Michigan in 2004. Um, it's, a, it's a it's a really funny story, but I wound up actually marrying my co-angler, my wife, Kim. <laughs> and uh, okay. it, nice. I, I fished a, an Everstar tournament out here in 2002. That's how I got to Michigan. Um, I, I started fishing major tournaments in, you know, early nine, I guess in the early 90s. I fished a lot of the Bassmaster stuff a lot of the FLW stuff, and I, I just happened to do pretty well. In, you know, early in my career, I qualified for both the FLW Tour at the time and the what is now the Bassmaster Elite Series. Um, it was called the Bassmaster Tour at the time. So I was actually one of the guys that was fishing both of the major tours, you know, in the early 2000s. So oh, wow. I did a lot, a lot of fishing, you know, tournament fishing back then. And then once I got to the point where you know, it, it's tough to make a living tournament fishing. Even if I did fairly well, it was still tough to make a living at it. And, you know, the travel, the wear and tear of being away from home all the time, eventually <clears throat> I, got, I got out of it. So as far as the guiding part of it went, um, one of the guys out on tour, he actually lived in Michigan. He was living in Michigan, and he kind of got me into he, – he had asked me if I was interested in guiding. So – I tried it and I really, really enjoyed it. I fell in love with guiding. I felt the gratification of seeing people happy all the time when you take them out fishing. And it was just, you know, I felt like I could educate people with a lot of what I had learned on all my, you know, previous years fishing the major tours. So I did a little bit of overflow, you know, working for another guide at that time. And then I pretty much came to the conclusion that I wanted to do things a little bit different than the way, you know, that operation was running which was all good, and I wanted to do things myself. So I started up my own business. I'd say it had to be about seven, eight years ago now. I'm losing track of time. It's going so fast. I started up my own business, and, I mean, in, in no time at all, I was pretty much booked every single day. And what I did at that point was look for, you know, another individual to help me out with my overflow. And from that point, it went from one to five right now. So that's where we stand, and we're, we're all pretty happy all excellent guides, excellent people also, and excellent fishermen. So it's it's a great, you know, it's a great situation to be in. So that's pretty yeah. much, you know, my rundown. Okay. What, what drew you to Michigan? What uh, drew you to, I mean, obviously Lake St. Clair, famous well, lake. I mean, I, I was actually fishing an Everstart tournament at the time, and it yeah. was the final tournament of the year. It was on the Detroit River, um, and I was doing pretty well on that circuit at the time. Um, I was, you know, it, actually I think I was in third place going into the points, going into the last tournament of the year for the Angler of the Year, and I was like, man, I needed to have a good tournament. Well, <laughs> lo and behold, I, you know, on the first day of the tournament, I drew, I drew a woman, <laughs> and I didn't know at that point that later she'd be my wife. <laughs> so, but I, you know, what happened was, you know, I had a good time. We had a good time on the water. As far as, you know, we both, she was a very good fisherman. We had, you know, we communicated, had fun as far as, you know, talking about fishing and stuff like that. We stayed in touch and, you know, through time, before you knew it, I was out here in Michigan and 
I never actually once I once I moved out here, I never looked back, and I love it here. I really do. Yeah, it's got it's got everything you'd want. You know, fishing, hunting. If you like the outdoors, this is the place to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to ask a quick question here. So, sure. So, who, who, who runs the boat, her or you? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I'm guiding, it's me. When, it, when, it's, her, when it's her and us, <laughs> she's the chief. Fair enough. I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Oh. Yeah, well. That's a good one. It was, it was great at the, in the tournament because in the tournament, it, it was I've never had somebody she actually came on the boat and she actually brought waypoints with her and it, it's a long story but what happened was I had trolling motor problems I was doing well I had a good place to go catch a bunch of fish but we had some trolling motor problems we had to get it fixed we only we drove all the way back to the boat ramp took the boat off the water had the service crew try to service the trolling motor we couldn't get it fit we, we couldn't get it fixed so we had to go to a backup plan you know, I had driven the boat from Elizabeth Park all the way to Lake St. Clair. So I came all the way back. And then we spent the last three hours on Lake Erie. And she had a couple of waypoints that were very close to where my waypoints. I had two, a couple of waypoints. So we kind of snuck in between and we caught them. We caught them really good. And lo and behold, she wound up getting a check. At, she got a check in a tournament. And I wound up, you know, making the cut in the tournament and, before you knew it, I was fortunate enough to even sneak Angler of the Year out of the whole ball of wax. So that was pretty cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. So you met your wife fishing that way, and you said the first time you have you had boat problems. Yeah. And, and she still stuck with you after that. I'm sorry, what was that? I said, and she still stuck with you after that, even after yeah. having the boat. That, that's good. Well, I, I think, you know, I think it was <laughs> that we were both persistent. We weren't going to give up. We knew that, you know, we... You know, to do well, we had to just work hard for eight hours of fishing, you know. So at that point, when we came back, had the service crew look at things, we had about three to four hours left. We went in a whole, totally different direction at, the, at that point. We put our nose to the grind, both got a limit of good, you know, good, solid, pretty big smallies. And, you know, I guess, you know, faith was with us, I guess. And, you know, it just all worked out well. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, all, it's an awesome story. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, more about the, the guide service, you know, someone contacts you and, uh, you know, what, what can they expect? What do they need to bring? Um, do you, do you assess, uh, their skill set prior or how does that all work when someone brings you up? Yeah. Um, basically, I mean, when, when we do a guide trip, um, what we, what we do is we, we let them know up front. They are, Welcome to bring any other equipment, lures, baits, whatever they want into the boat. But we do have all the rods and reels they'd need, all the tackle that they would need. Um, as far as food goes, we have them bring their own food, but we do supply ice and water if, if they want some ice and water to drink. If they want to bring anything else, they're welcome to bring it you know, on board. But as far as on the fishing end, all they really need is a license. And I tell them a lot of times to bring sun, you know, sunglasses and rain gear. Um, sometimes we'll have some extra sunglasses. Sometimes we'll have some extra rain gear on the boat. But, you know, in general, we tell them pretty much sunglasses, rain gear, a fishing license, and whatever they're, they're going to eat and drink for the day other than ice and water. Tackle, okay. we'll have everything in there, all, all myself and any of the other four or five guides. So, okay. you know, we, the, the trips we book, we, we book them you know, according to the, the fishermen. Some people only want to do a half day trip, which I'd call as a four hour trip. Some day, some people want to do an eight hour trip and some people want to even do longer than that, which, you know, we'll charge a little extra to do a little bit longer, but I get guys from Texas that, Hey, they're already here. They, they'd rather fish for 10 hours. If that's what the guy wants, that's what we're going to give them. Um, we have trips for all kinds of people. Sometimes I get dad and little Joey. Okay. If it's dad, and little Joey, I know that he's there, you know, the father's there to take his son out to catch fish. At that point, you know, I'm going to, you know, kind of get a feel for what they're really looking for. Some people want a trophy fish. They want big fish. The dad with the son, he probably wants just to catch fish. So, we, you know, we may uh, go about things just a little bit differently in that situation. Um, I have guys that want to, you know, I do some trophy trips up in northern Michigan. I have guys that, you know, they don't even care if they catch a fish all day. 
if they have an opportunity, you know, they want to just have an opportunity to catch a six pound fish. I mean, I love it when we're doing that, but because we're going to catch fish anyway, but still, you know, the, the best way to catch giant fish is to fish for giant fish. So, and then I get another group of people that really want to be educated. And that's where I see, I think a lot of guides go wrong. They don't, they're afraid to educate the other anglers in fear that they will be able to do what, you know, what you've taught them on their own. Well, my theory is this, if I teach somebody how to catch fish, I give them a good time, teach them how to fish and they do well. What they're going to do is they may not book with me, but they're going to send two people to come fish with me. So I really don't care. I'm going to win one, you know, one way or the other. And I love the educational part of, you know, teaching people what I'm looking for out there, how I'm going about things, all the little different, you know, scenarios that you may have out there. So that's a really, that's a fun thing. It's a challenging thing. You know, talking about the education, I want to jump in real quick with that. Sure. You're starting to see a little more of that uh, all across, I think, across the outdoors. You know, it used to be back in the day, you know, it'd be you and a close buddy, and you didn't want anybody else going because you didn't want anybody seeing how you caught the fish, didn't right. see where you caught the fish. Uh, obviously, if you're guiding, they know where you caught the fish because they're with you. But yeah. uh, I, I'm starting to see even, like, uh, things on, on the Internet, people doing inform. Uh, like uh, educational type things of how to catch a certain species or you know whatever the conditions may be um is is that something you, you you're seeing more of on your side as well i assume right yeah i, I mean I, I i'm noticing that a lot i mean you got to remember things have changed dramatically in the last 20 years and um, you know before, before you you know years ago we didn't have college teams we didn't have high school teams these kids are all getting a great great jump especially in this area it's all over the place, high school teams mm -hmm. and college teams. I mean, we have some of the – Adrian College is one of the best colleges, if not the best college in the whole nation for bass fishing. So a lot of these guys are great fishermen, great kids. I know, you know, there's a lot of them that I even know just through, you know, meeting them. I've done seminars where I've seen them, and it's just great seeing them all do good and getting such a great jump in life. I, when I look back in my career, I think the one thing that I really wish I could have done differently was start doing this a lot earlier. I wasn't brought up doing, you know, bass fishing in, in, in a tournament environment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the internet to be educated and learn all the little things that you see. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody wants to learn how to drop shot, you type in drop shot on the YouTube and before you know it, you got a choice of 50 things to watch. I mean, you have to filter out what's good, what's not good, and what you want to see. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, there, there is a lot of good information out there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I didn't know that Adrian College had, I, I've heard about the high school, on the high school level, um, and I've heard that it was starting to creep into the college, but I didn't know Adrian had a, uh, a college team. That's, that's awesome. They, I think they, I mean, they've, they're one of the top teams in the whole country by far. Yeah. You think it's just because of being here in Michigan uh, and having ample opportunity to catch so many different species uh, or have so many lakes that's got bass in it? I think, I think the thing is, I think that they have the opportunity to fish for both smallmouth and largemouth. We have a lot of inland lakes. They, they, you could become pretty versatile if you stick with a lot of the inland lakes around, not just Lake St. Clair, because Lake St. Clair is a lake all by itself. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of dock fishing, for, you know, a lot of uh, matted vegetation here. So you could do some frogging, you could do some skipping, you could jig fish, you could fish milfoil, you could fish for, you know, with, as far as largemouth go, you could fish for smallmouth in, in numerous lakes. It could be rocky, it could be sandy. So there's a lot, a lot of things that I notice in this area that you can really do and learn on. And I also think, you know, they're, they're coached well. I mean, there's no doubt a, a, a college can't be good when, you know, consistently by, by just the anglers, uh, you know, they're not just getting the best anglers all the time. I think their mm -hmm. coach is doing a really a great job with the kids. And because every, it seems like every new group of kids that comes in there, seems like they always do well. So, you know, I got to, you know, hats off to these guys. I mean, that, the whole group of kids and the staff are doing a wonderful job. All right, I tell you what, we're running just a little bit long here, so we're, let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, we're going to step outside. When we come back, um, I'm going to let Ken go ahead. I know he's got a million questions for you, so uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after this. Okay, for those of you on the live stream, if you got questions, get them in. I see quite a few of you in the house tonight, so uh, 
get them in here if you've got questions. We'll we'll be glad to answer them along the way. Yeah, see. we're getting ready to dive into uh, you know tactics and and technique and uh, what to look for, and I know we're gonna get into that. Okay, one second here. I'm almost. Ready. Yeah, I know. I know a couple guys. I got a, a good friend of mine, Miles, uh, fishes for Adrian, and uh, that is a top-notch school right now. They're, they're guys very are competitive. Awesome. These kids are awesome. Yeah. Yep. That is so nice to hear that their kids are having that opportunity to do something like that in, in, on a college level and, and a team. Yeah. That that is incredible. Yeah, college well, bass fishing is huge now. Okay, here we go. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What one of the guides, that, uh, young kids that guides for me, his name is Cody Johnson. He actually he was the uh, captain of the Brighton High School team, and that's kind of I pretty much met him, you know, do. Uh, doing a seminar there and now before you know it now he's guiding with me all the time nice so it's it's pretty cool awesome. you know watching them come out and make works. their own yeah that is cool okay here we go stand by in three two one welcome back second segment of the show we're sitting here talking a little fishing uh special edition on a saturday night we're actually pre-recording this show for mother's day for those of you on the podcast uh that are wondering why we're talking about before Mother's Day, but this is a pre-record, but I've got uh, Ken Seclus sitting down on the UNJ boat dock with his toes in the water. We're talking fishing tonight, so Ken, <laughs> I'm going to let you dive right back into it. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, so yeah, Marcel, you know, <laughs> years ago when I first bought my boat, um, the first thing that I naturally want, I just have a little 14 and a half foot aluminum boat, and on a calm day, I can go on Lake St. Clair, and it's great, and Back in those days, I, the first, you know, when spring came around, I had to get to Lake St. Clair. And um, I didn't know anything uh, except to throw tubes. And uh, so I went out there with a big bag of tubes and, and a fishing pole. And uh, I, I couldn't believe how many boats there were this time of year. And I just went out of Selfridge there. And I think I just want to start here, you know, in the springtime. You know, for a guy going out, you know, when I went out there, I just kind of hung around the boats and I caught fish, you know, but this time of year for the average guy who doesn't go out to St. Clair a lot or doesn't really know anything. I mean, what, what are you looking for on Lake St. Clair? How can you get away from the crowds or should you just stay with the crowds and, and just do that? I mean, what's, what are we targeting this time of year? Well, well, this time of the year right now, I mean, if you go out there, it's tough to get away from the crowds because first of all, yeah. Half of the lake is shut down. I mean, we cannot fish Canadian waters, so that takes all the boats, oh, keeps them in right. a smaller area. Um, predominantly, uh, the mile, the, you know, the area which we call the mile roads, um, that that is one of the best spawning flats, on, you know, in the country anywhere. So you're going to have the majority of the people coming up there and fishing in a small area. The whole key to, you know, to being consistent and, you know, one reason why a lot of my guides and, you know, I can go out there and catch fish every day is because through time, I've learned all the little sweet spots on the community hole or community area. You know, even though it's an area, the whole key to bass fishing and to being consistently good out there is finding a sweet, the sweet spots in the areas. Sweet spot could, could consist of a boulder. It could uh, consist of a log that's down there. It could be a wreck that's down there, a rock pile that's down there, something of that nature. If you mark all those spots and through time, and you just run to those high percentage spots, you know, you're gonna find fish almost all the time out there. So in the springtime, if you pretty much put your boat in six to eight, six to 10 feet of water from this point on, or really from ice out all the way up until I, I would say about the 10th of June is about the number that I would use where things start to really change. You're going to catch, you know, you're going to catch fish in that area, six to 10 feet. No problem. That's where they're going to spawn. That's where a lot of the pre-spawn action is going to take place. And, you know, you should have a good day. Okay. So you alluded to, you know, June 10th, things start to change. And, you know, I've heard from uh, several other guys talk about how um, these big schools of smallmouth, uh, obviously they follow the bait around and they move around the lake. Can you talk about, you know, because I've always wondered this too, I mean, how do, you, how do you go about following these fish around? I mean, what, 
after June 10th, what's your first step? What are you looking for there? Well, you know, because I'm on the water every day, I could kind of go with the flow of things a right. little bit. Um, yeah. And, you know, of course, time on the water is another thing that's going to help me. Understanding, you know, how the fish migrate in the lake and to what they're doing. What you, what you see in the beginning is, you know, you got your spawning fish. Once they're done spawning at that point, the, the bite changes a little bit. You know, they're not chasing as much. It's just the females have slowed down a lot. The males have been guarding fry for a long time. You know, they, they're, they're thin, they're run down, they're beat up a little bit, they're tired. So they're not in chasing mode at that time. So at that point, you really got to start to slow down, fish things that are a little bit like a, a, a little bit more subtle type baits. I would say something like a soft, uh, soft stick bait, you know, like a, a fluke or a caffeine shad or something of that nature. Um, a set, you know, any kind of uh, soft stick bait also, you know, yeah. like a Ocho, Senko, whatever somebody wants Wagyu. to call the bait that they use. Yeah. You know, they're, they're the kind of baits that are going to really trigger your strikes at that point. A drop shot's going to come into play big time because you can fish it slow, methodical. And then even the two, the two bite never goes away. That's always, always, you know, there. But what yeah. you're doing is you're, you're, you're kind of, the fish are going to start pulling out of that six to ten feet. And I, I noticed the first really break that they take seems like it's in that 12 to 14 foot range, tw maybe 12 to 15 foot range. But... It doesn't really last to me that long in that area unless it's a very cool year where sometimes they really never, you know, a lot of fish will stay in that zone. Last year, for instance, was a very odd year. The water has been higher than ever. I felt it was, we never got that really, really hot period of time. We had fish in 22 feet of water. We had fish in six feet of water, four feet of water all year long. They were so spread out. So the fish were there. They were just a lot, you know, a lot spread out but usually on a normal common year they'll stop in that 12 to 14 foot range what you're looking for at that time i look for is um, the grasses start to come into play i start to look for little isolated grass patches i don't really like big big grassy areas i look for isolated stuff small patches when i say small patches it could be 10 yards by 20 yards things like that why the grass because that's where you're going to find the bait you know that's where the bait's going to start to migrate to the grass generates oxygen oxygen is going to pull in the bait the bait's going to pull in the bass so that's pretty much what you're looking for or you're looking for irregularities out there it could be humps sometimes rock piles humps things like that out there that's what i'm looking for okay once you know once you get by that pre-spawn then they're going to make the next move and it's going to continue revolving around food the food sources that is going to be towards the where I like it the most, the middle of the lake in no man's land. It's the toughest area to figure out, but it changes every year um, in a lot of things, and some of it remains the same. Of course, a wreck, that'll remain the same. A boulder will remain the same. Um, but there are the grass in the lake does change. It grows differently from year to year, and if you can find the right cabbage beds, grass beds of different kinds, I mean, you could really, really have a banner day out there. And if you find those wads of fish, you know, it's, it could be awesome out there. What's your, what's your, what type, what's your favorite type of grass that you're looking for? What's, when you see that, you're like, all right, you know, we're cabbage. good. What, what, cabbage? Yeah. Broadleaf cabbage. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yep. If you get, I mean, if the cabbage comes up and you got, you know, a good area with a lot of cabbage, I mean, I, it seems like the smallies really, really like it. Smallies aren't fish that, you know, they're a lot different than a largemouth, okay? I mean, a largemouth will ambush things. Smallies are sight feeders. Um, they get on the edges of the grass and more. They'll run edges a lot more. They, they'll run the perimeters a lot more compared to a largemouth will get directly in there. He'll sit right in the grass, just like they are like under docks. Um, they get in the thickest things. You can go punch mats in a lake, but when you punch mats in a lake, very rarely do you catch a smallmouth. They're more, you right. know, they move around a lot more. Yeah. Now you met. You talked about something a second ago that kind of got my attention. You talked about the lake was the water level was really high. Now, and we were taught. You mentioned also mentioned how the tube bite um, never goes away. It's always there. Now, do you notice? I mean, when the water level is up, is is that bottom bite 
hard to get going and do you more fish up in the water column when the water is high or does it not, does that not matter you know it, honestly it doesn't re- it doesn't really to me it doesn't really matter that much it just makes the lake a, you know it create makes the lake a little bit bigger it makes spots that are right. normally you know 10 feet they may be 12 feet so it changes yeah. things a little little bit but last year with the water high we also you know the you know the added element was the fact that um, we had a cooler year so the water temperature really didn't get super warm for a long period of time not as you know not as warm as it does on most years so to me what it did was it spread things out a lot more it really did it, it there were fish all over the lake to be caught I, I mean but I didn't find what I'd call the, the biggest groups that I was finding in previous years the fishing was just as good but I just had to hit more spots to do as well yeah. that's all it was now, just just like with any, you know, I'm sure, just like with any other fisherman, I mean, you have an arsenal of baits, and I mean, are you're are you, the how you choose your baits? I mean, is that just based on conditions, water temperature, clarity, things like that? You just have a cycle of baits that you run through for any yes, given day. I, I, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when I start off the season, I mean, there's no doubt when it when the water's cold, like it had from let's just say prior to today. I would say a blade bait would be one of my top choices. Whenever it's 48, 50 degrees or less, a blade bait really comes into play. I also like okay. throwing a, a diving jerk bait, something, you know, not a, not a super big diving jerk bait, but a diving jerk bait, something that gets down just a little bit more and suspends. Something I could move through the water column, but also give it a good long pause. Because a lot of times you need, when that water's cold, you need a long pause. Another thing I like, I do like throwing crankbaits this time of the year. When I'm cranking, it's usually going to be something that goes down six, eight feet of water. And, you know, just so I something I can get into the rocks a little bit. You know, usually I like colors like the browns and greens and browns a little bit. If the water's dirty, I'll go with something more chartreuse, something a little bit brighter, something with some red in it also at this time of the, you know, at this time of the yeah. year. But as far as the baits, you know, go, the tube will always come into play early. And the other bait that I do throw a lot early is going to be a swim bait. But right now, this time of the year, we're getting to the time where things are going to change a little bit. Um, Even though we haven't been on the water much, these fish are going to move to beds, you know, really, really quickly when it occurs. So I would say within about a week, you know, there's, there's a good chance if it warms up within about a week or two, within the next week or two, you're going to start to see a lot more people catching fish that are going to start to move to, you know, beds. They may, they may be running a little bit late this year only because the air temperature has been a little bit cooler lately. It wasn't, yeah. it, it warmed up early this year though. That's the thing, but it cooled back down yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And hey, we got a question uh, from, from one of the people watching from Terry. He said, uh, uh, as a general rule, what are your color tendencies and types of lures that you're using? I mean, just as a general rule, where somebody would start. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I do have on Lake. I'll, I'll stick with Lake St. Clair a little bit, but in general, you can never go wrong with plastics, with browns and greens, green pumpkin, watermelon, my two best colors by far. If I'm fishing for largemouth bass, you know, if I'm fishing in the lake, largemouth bass. There's no doubt uh, I would be throwing something with a purple, it, you know, it, uh, anything like a blue, like that blue fleck or a June bug or something like that. But smallmouth bass, it's going to be greens and browns for the most part, as far as plastics. Crankbaits, okay, on crankbaits, I, I, I'm a, a, a big natural color guy. I like natural colors. I stick with any of the shad related colors as long as I'm in clear water. Early in the year, early in the year, like right now, I will tie on something that's a little bit brown, a little bit green crankbaits. And like I said earlier, if it's dirty water, I'm going to go into chartreuses, reds, and oranges a little <clears> bit. <throat> but I'd like to really stick, you know, stick with the with the natural colors. All right. I tell you what, we're uh, we're bumping up here on our second break. So uh, let's go ahead. We take our second break. We'll come back and uh, we'll turn Ken loose again because I know he's got a whole list of questions there. So (laughs) we're going to step outside. We'll take our next break. We'll be right back after this. Okay, guys and gals, if you got more questions, get them in. 
How, how long do you pause that jerk bait, Marcel? Do you have a number you count to? You know, I, I don't really, I wouldn't say I have a number that I count to, but I mean, if you can give it five seconds, that's really good. It's really yeah. crazy because, it, you know, it's a hard thing to do if you don't get bit on it within a, the first 15, 20 minutes of throwing it, that long pause. It's like, oh my gosh, this is really yeah. tough. But if yeah. you can do it, there's no doubt that'll trigger strikes from them, you know, from fish in cold cold water they're lethargic at that point they're, they're not in the right. mood to chase much but if you leave it in front of them you know it's just like let's just say you're sitting on the couch with a bag of potato chips if you stick that bag of potato chips in front of you and it just sits there i think in about <laughs> five seconds you're ready to stick your hand right. in that bag and grab one if it's just yeah. there for a, if it's there for a quick second you may but you 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 have a little bit more resistance at that point. So, yeah. But don't let that thing dangle in front of you for a while. Because I'll tell you what, something, something's grabbing it. I've never heard fishing equated to eating potato chips, but that's good. I like that. That makes sense to me. <laughs> All right. You, you really got to think of the mood of the mood of fish. A lot of people, you know, they don't put it in perspective. I mean, yeah. fish yeah. are a living creature. I mean, they're the habits that they have are a lot. You know. A lot like us, they get lazy. You know, I mean, when a woman has a baby, she doesn't go out, you know, and run 100 miles the next day. Right. A, a, a bass spawns, she's going to slow down for a little while. She's going to take it easy for a little while and then build herself back up. You know, it's a, it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's the way the fish are. Right. No, it makes complete sense. All right, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. Welcome back, third segment of the show, uh, sitting here talking a little bass fishing, and uh, for those of you on the podcast who aren't watching the live stream, you need to go back and watch during the commercial breaks because we just heard potato chips in comparison to fishing. I'm not going to give it away. You got to go listen in the middle of break, too. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, Ken, uh, I'm yeah. going to let you take it away again. Yeah, okay, so we talked about um, this time of year, how the fish move out. You know, one thing I've always, because, you know, the bulk of the fishing seasons in the heat of the summer, um, you know, I, I've messed around in, in the channels, and uh, when I did fish, you know, the, the tried to fish in the channels. I've never really full route on the main lake. You, you mentioned that you like to go out into no man's land, and you mentioned isolated patches of grass are you still looking for that same thing out in the middle of the lake are you looking for even deeper water yeah i, I don't have a you know there's not one particular depth i don't even pay attention yeah. to the depth the lake is like yeah. a bowl okay yeah and when i'm out there i mean i'm constantly constantly looking at my graph what i'm yeah. looking for are any irregularities at all um I could tell you this. I have numerous spots that are a guy could be fishing 10 yards, 20 yards away, they won't catch a fish. And if you're on the, I mean, when I say on the spot, you have to know what's down there. That's the thing. A lot of times it could be one individual log, one individual little piece of wood. It could be one rock. That's it. One particular rock. It could be a wreck. I mean, I do fish numerous wrecks because they're consistent fish holders. Things like that. I mean, there are little things like that. When I'm when I'm driving, you know, into an area that I've you know had success in the past, a lot of times I'm going to look at that grass. I mean, graph. When I see grass showing up, what I'm looking for is new. It's new submergent vegetation. If you want to follow the fish, look for the new grass. When I say new grass, it's not always all the way up to the surface. The fresher the grass, the newer the grass, the more oxygen it's going to generate which is going to attract your bait fish. And that's how the bait fish will move also. So I'm always looking for those small little patches of new fresh grass out in the middle of the lake. I'll keep an eye if I see some cabbage coming up in the middle of the lake early in the year. What I'll do is I'll keep an eye on it. I may even mark it. Go back there in a couple of weeks. And if I see more of it coming up, I know, you know that's the kind of an area I'm really looking for. It could be a hot area as far as that goes. Now with structure scan, side scan, and all that good stuff that we have on our electronics, you know, a lot of times I could I could see out to the side. I, I, I mean, it could be one tire could be out there, and that tire could hold, consistently hold fish. It may not hold 30 fish, but you know what? If you go to that tire, just about every single time, you may be able to catch one to five fish off of it. 
Well, in the day, if you stop at 20 spots like that, I think you, you could do the math. Your numbers are going to be pretty good. Yeah. And that's the now kind you, of stuff I'm, I'm looking for out there. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned the electronics. And, you know, besides GPS, I know I, I, I have side imaging. Um, I mean, do you rely on that side imaging pretty heavy out there? Is that your, I mean, what, what part of the electronics do you rely on the most? Was it the side wow. imaging? That's that's a little tough one. I mean, of course, it's got to be your GPS because right. that's getting yeah. you back to the that's getting you back to the bullseye. But no, I mean, as far know, as looking for structure. But the yeah. thing is, the GPS is not going to get you to something new. So right. to learn, I mean, of course, so you know, it's all super critical. Um, yeah. You can't go across the lake 100 miles an hour and actually, you know, side scan and do stuff like that. But when I'm going from one spot to another, I'm bum idling. I am always looking out to my sides to see if there's, a, you know, an extra log. I may, right. uh, you, you, you may go five days in a row, never see nothing, but you may find one rock. If you mark it and you go back, that may be uh, a bullseye. I had found something um, two years ago on Lake St. Clair. I had just gone over a little area. I was idling to another spot, and I see something down here that caught my eye. It was definitely uh, something round. It looked like a tire. I don't think it was a tire. I still don't know to this day what it was, but it was really crazy. I seen it. I marked it. I, I turned the boat around, and I wanted to go fish it, but all of a sudden, I, I was in the middle of the lake, and a thunderstorm was coming up, and it was coming up quick. So I was getting upset because I could, didn't have time to fish it. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank God I had marked it. I went back the next, yeah. you know, the next trip. Uh, it was, I think it was the next day. And when I was in that area, and you know, I caught, I think, just on this little tiny target, I caught, set, you know, between my clients and myself, we had caught seven fish off of it. So, yeah. you know, it was just something else that they added to the arsenal. And, you know, if you put time in, due diligence, you're going to find a lot of that stuff out there, you know, on the lake. What, now, as far as catching real big ones, you know, the, the five, five and over, the fives, the six, the seven-pound fish, you know, what it takes to bring in a, a mid-20s bag. I mean, have you noticed certain types of structure out there hold it, or is it kind of random? You could pull up to a wreck one day, and, they're, you know, the, the big ones aren't there, but then you go to the wreck next week, and there's a bunch of six-pounders on it. I mean, is it kind of hit or miss like that, or it, you it, notice it's a, a it's, trend? You know, it's, it's more of a random thing, I think. I yeah. think it's just... More, more than that, it, it comes down to time of the year. I mean, if you're looking, yeah. you know, for a guy looking for a trophy fish, if you're looking to target fish that are over five pounds, especially yeah. five and a half pounds or more, I would tell you, you're going to have to go out and pre-spawn and either very late summer into, you know, the fall. I, I mean, uh, October is a great time. If you're looking for a giant, if you're looking for the biggest fish in the lake, I think October is probably your best time. If not, a couple weeks ago. Six pounders, you know, your chance of getting a six pounder, of guys getting six pounders, which there aren't as many caught as people say, you know, there are a, a lots of six pounders caught by guys that don't have scales, I can tell you that. <laughs> but <laughs> the true six pounders on a scale, you don't, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot rarer than people think. But pre spawn, I would say when the water temperature is, you know, below, you know, 50, below 55 is a great time, and then fall feed. There's no doubt in the fall, that's when they really, really show up. They start to get fat, they fatten up. They're really feeding on bait fish, you know, before the, you know, winter time. And that's a great time to catch a giant. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I follow it. You know, I follow the tournaments and, you know, I mean, for a while it seemed like if you had 20 to 22 pounds uh, on Lake St. Clair, you were good. Yep. And uh, there's some years, I think last year it took 25, 26 pounds to win out there. Yeah. And it just seems like there's cycles of that out there. And yeah, uh, that, that, it, it's true. It, it, there are cycles like that, but you got to understand another thing. The f yeah. Technology is getting to the point where uh, the bass can't hide anymore. <laughs> so right. we have so many good fishermen out there with so much, you know, so much technology. You know, there, there are many things hidden out there. You know, we're going to get to the point where every fish in that lake is going to be found, and it's it's going to come down to execution more, yeah. I think. You know, it's really going to come down to downsizing. You know, years ago, now, if you if you look back in the history of bass fishing, you, if you look at all the fishermen that did really, really well years ago, they were all power fishermen that, you know, fished, fished a jig, fished a spinnerbait, did, you know, they just covered a lot of water with big baits. Now, you know, all of a sudden, with the way 
electronics are and offshore fishing has become so much more popular, you're seeing the finesse fishermen now become a, you know, a major player in winning a lot of tournaments on a lot of these lakes. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt about that. Um, you, you know, I got a question here. Talk, you, you're talking about the electronics and how things have progressed. We talk about this in the hunting industry as well. You know, at, at what point uh, does the electronics take over? It, it, does it take away from the experience, do you think? Are, are we going too far? I, I don't know. I'm just asking, not, you know, make, thinking out loud. I, I don't think it has yet, but I think we're closing in on that. You know what I mean? It, it, it's getting to the point where... It's almost like you're going to know exactly where every single fish <laughs> fish is in the lake. I mean, you know, it's getting getting that good. I don't know where it's going to get to the point where it's going to, you know, get, you know, make it not as fun. I guess I don't know how to put it. Right. The thing is, the thing you got to remember is you still have to trigger the bite, though. And there is an art to triggering a bite. It's not always that easy. Figuring out, you know, when these push, fish become so high pressured, we're going to have to adapt because they're not going to bite as easily because they're going to know. You know, they've been caught before, mm -hmm. and it's going to take a lot more to, to catch these fish. Lighter lines, smaller baits, you know, different techniques that, you know, you think every technique has been found. Trust me, there's going to be something new within the next year or two. And then two years after that, there's going to be something new again. You know, it's there always is. It's just the way it is. You know, so talking along those lines about triggering the bite and, and fish getting accustomed to a certain, certain thing that's out there, a certain style or whatever that may be. I know like in, in waterfowl hunting, uh, the guys who are, are kind of going back to those old school ways of, of, of hiding their, their, their blinds and things uh, are having more success because the, the geese haven't, or ducks haven't seen that in so long that they're, they're going back to old school tastic, tactics. Do you think that's, is that something you, you may see or are you already seeing some of that? I think I think you'll see a little bit of it. I mean, I notice, you know, even myself. You know, a lot of times I'll fish areas that there, there are no other boats, not because not because there, you know, there's more fish there. I, sometimes I'd rather fish for less fish that are active than a lot of fish that are not active. Mm. If that makes sense to you, yeah. Because there there are community holes out there where there could be oh, thousands of fish, but you put all the boats on top of them, those fish shut down. I'd rather go to a spot in the middle of the lake, may only have 20 fish, but if, you know, five or 10 of them fish bite, I'm going to be a lot better off than, the, you know, sitting over top of a thousand that aren't biting. So, you know, I think, you know, getting away from the crowd, I think is a good thing. I think a lot more people need to get away from the crowd, but I don't think, you know, they don't, I don't think they have the confidence to get away from the crowd. They, they're going to feel like they're missing something if they're not a part of the group. Me. I can't wait to, if I see the group, I try to go in the other direction. <laughs> it's kind of like on ice fishing. We go out and you look to see where everybody's at. And it's like, well, they're all over there. They got to be biting. So you go there and all of a sudden one lone guy takes off to get away from the crowd and the crowd follows them. <laughs> so I understand what you're saying. Uh, I tell you what, though, we're working up here on our last break. Let's go ahead and take our last break. When we come back, uh, we'll, we'll spend the rest of the time we got uh, letting Ken ask a few more questions. So let's step outside to take our next break. We'll be right back after this. Okay. Last chance to get questions in, folks. You know, it, it's some of the things you've brought tonight. Like I said, I'm not so much a fisherman as I am a, a worm drowner. But a lot of the stuff that you've opened my eyes to, it, it makes sense. There, there's just, it's been a really good conversation tonight. And, and for somebody like me who's, who's not what I would call, like I said, a fisherman, um, I've learned some stuff. I'm, I'm, myself, I mean, I'm fortunate that I, you know, I, I, I think I feel like I, I got a great education when I, you know, living on the East Coast mm -hmm. where fishing was a little bit tougher. There was a, you know, there was a lot more pressure, you know, back there. You know, there just wasn't as much water. But I also had the chance to fish a lot of different types of water. And then, you know, going on tour, I was fortunate to, you know fish with a lot of good fishermen, fish against, you know, when I say a lot of good fishermen, I mean, I fished with and against the best fishermen in the world. So that being said, 
it, I, I feel like I learned a lot. And when you can learn a lot from the guys you you know you're hanging around with, mm -hmm. if you hang around with good fishermen, good people, you're going to learn you know, and you share information. You're going to learn a lot of stuff like that. So I was fortunate to be able to do that, and that helped me, you know, helps me here, you know, as far as a guide and understanding other fishermen and what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes back to what you were saying earlier in the show about you know sharing that knowledge with other people, you know, even yeah. new people or people that are looking for that next that next thing to take their their skill a little further so yeah it makes sense all right here we go stand by in three two and one welcome back last segment of the show uh before we get too far into this last segment um i mean the first thing we talked about tonight was your guiding service so if somebody that's listening or, or watching tonight uh would like to get a hold of you and, and, re and talk to you about taking a trip where can they get a hold of you and you know is it on the internet you know a phone number uh, tell people how they can get in touch with you yep um if somebody wants to get a hold of me they can go to my website it's www.marcellsguideservice.com all one word marcellsguideservice.com um they can all always find me on instagram also on that instagram twitter it's marcell's guide service on each one of them too or they could call me on my cell phone um at 810 Five zero three five. So, and you give still me got... a sh give me a shout, and you know, I will definitely, you know, I'll tell you exactly what you can expect. You know, it's funny because I have a lot of people. They want to know, you know, when is the, the most common question? When is the best time to come up? <laughs> and my answer to these people is, it's always a good time to come up. The best time is when the weather is good, because. You know, our, our fishing, it's, we have one of the bodies of water, Lake St. Clair, that I can say is one of the very rare bodies of water that all summer long, it's good. It's, it's not okay. It's good all summer long. There are biting fish. And in most places in the country, I mean, I get a lot of clients from Texas, Arkansas, places like that. It's too hot to even go outside. Here, you know, we may have a hot, you know, a little hot spell, but I'll tell you what, our fishing is consistently on on that lake so that's a good thing you know something special that we have in our you know short window of you know, a season of seven months of bass fishing eight months of bass fishing right yeah you know michigan when it turns nasty it turns nasty quick and it can stay that way yeah. for a long time <laughs> so <laughs> so get a hold of them and uh you know uh, the phone number or the website and, and like you said earlier in the show you still got spots available right i i do have i do have some spots available but then again if I'm not available, I have, you know, five other guys that all work with me as a team. They help me out. They do my overflow. And we, the, all five of us, we communicate, we work together, we share areas. So if somebody's struggling a little bit, which is one of the best things in the world, you know, about having a good guy, guiding business, great guys, these guys are all outstanding fishermen and we share information and we pull each other in if we're struggling. So it's, you know, just an awesome group of guys. Yeah, that's the way to be, you know, working, working yeah. together, you know, you know, teamwork makes the dream work, as they say, so. Oh, yeah, yep. Well, Ken, we, we've got about yeah. uh, t 10, 12 minutes here, so I'm going to let you take it away again. Yeah, Marcel, I, I, I just got a couple more questions. So, you know, one thing I, was, I, I actually experienced at one time out there, and I know it's not the, you know, as far as tournaments go, I don't think it's the winning deal, but, you know, if you have a blow day, and they and yep. the clients want to go out. Do you ever do you ever target largemouth on Lake Saint Clair? <laughs> That's a tough thing for me to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, I love fishing for largemouth. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I, it's I very that very the rare that I'll target uh, on Lake Saint Clair, even if the wind is blowing. I I, I feel okay. like I could find most of. Here's the thing: most of my clients come from out of state, from down south. A lot of the right. ones when they come right. from down south. They're, they want they're coming mouth. away from large enough to come to catch smallmouth. So right. for the most part, I stay away from them. Now, you that say, being said, I get a lot of guys from Michigan. It could be dad with little Joey again. You know, he needs his, he needs to have a string pulled. I'm going to take him in. We're going to do a little largemouth fishing. We may go, you know, into one of the marina areas, sea walls, a couple of the coves. We will target largemouths. We'll throw some soft, soft stick baits up there and, you know, do what we got to do to salvage the day if we have to get out. But usually yeah. I could get out to a place, and even if it's really windy, I could get to a place that where we can catch some smallmouth. It's very rare that we can't get out 
in catch smallmouth. The only thing that stops the trip for the most part is, I mean, if we have small craft advisories or storms that are threatening as far as thunderstorms and stuff like that, mm-hmm. that's, that's what's going to, you know, stop something from happening. Okay. And what would you say, you know, th- this is more along my lines because I don't, I don't ever, I don't fish like St. Clair a lot and uh, I, I'd like to. Um, I would never, probably not until I get a real bass boat, go out there on any kind of regular basis. But just for an average guy like myself that's going out there once or twice a year, what's what do you think the biggest mistake, you know, the average Joe fisherman makes when they go to St. Clair and they have a bad time? And what, what do you think they're doing wrong? What do you see the most? Uh, that's, a, that's a little bit of a tough question. I mean, okay. It, you know, you, you really got to, before you go out on the lake, I think you really need to talk to somebody and, you know, yeah. get, get a little bit of a bearing. I think you want to, I think you really want to launch in an area that's going to be pretty close to the area that you want to fish. So you're not running around the lake and you just got to, you got to learn to understand the fish. You know, that's what I see. Sometimes I see, you know, some of the locals that aren't avid fishermen that go out and they struggle. It's because they're really fishing in, you know, five, six feet of water when you should be fishing in 17 to 22 feet of water, that, stuff like that's that. That's what I, right, that's what you I know? mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I do see a lot of that, a lot of that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, I mean, I covered my list of questions. Um, is, is there anything else that we didn't talk about you feel like you want to mention about your guide service or about any kind of information about the lake? I mean, do you, do you think the the prospects are looking good this year for, uh, you know? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. I, I, I honestly do. I mean, I, you know, I, again, you know, because of the way things went, you know, I, I usually, I, I have a new boat that just came in. So right now I'll, you know, as soon as we're able to, I will be out there. I will start guiding. I did not get out prior to this. So I didn't really get a good touch of what was going on, but I do have some buddies that did get out the lake. They all said it's fishing outstanding so far. I think with, you know, with a little bit of a, a lack of pressure, which, you know, we had a little bit of a lack of pressure so far, I think it's going to help out things a little bit. I think the lake's just getting better and better. And the reason I say that, not because I guide on it, I just think the, the forage base is so phenomenal in that lake. You know, we have, we have crawfish, we have uh, thread fins, we have spot tail minnows, we have, um, uh, juvenile yellow perch, um, mayflies. There's so many, so much for these fish to eat. I think the, I think we're going to be in a good position for quite a few years to see, you know, numerous good quality fish, you know, on the lake. The only thing that scares me a little bit is, you know, that we, that we are in a small area and so many people come here to fish during the spawn, you know, we all love to take pictures and stuff like that. And, you know, with social media the way it is, people are holding fish out of the water a little bit longer than I think is good is good for the fish. But in general, I think overall, I think things are going to be great, honestly. I think the lake's going to fish really, really well this year. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm expecting it to have a phenomenal year. Um, I'll yeah. be on the lake probably – probably lose a couple of trips, but I'll probably be on St. Clair 100, 110 days. I'll probably be up in northern Michigan where I do, you know, I'll do trophy trips in northern Michigan. No specific lake, but I, I, I do, you know, out the Alpena side, the Indian River area, and the Traverse City area. I'll bounce around between the, those three areas, and I'll do some trophy trips up there, and I think, you know, the outlook up there should be good, too. So, is, I'm looking is for a great more, year. Is that more in the fall, the trophy trips? I, I mean, in I, northern I, Michigan. I, I would normally go up there um, in May. I'll go up there. Uh, I, I, realistically, I'd like to be up there right today, <laughs> but uh, yeah. unfortunately, you know, the way things have gone has gone. You know, I can't. But uh, I do. I, I like the fall, and I like this. You know, I like the pre-spawn bite up there a real lot. If I'm fishing for so, trophy fish, so I do wish. Some... Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. Someone can call you and just say, "Hey, Marcel, I." I don't want to go to St. Clair. I want to go and catch a trophy in northern Michigan, and, and, you, and you make that happen. I, I'm pretty certain. Just, I mean, there's a very good opportunity yeah. for them to catch, you know, 
catch a pretty big fish. No, you know, I mean, just that's all they got to do to do that. I mean, yeah, just, I mean, that's hey, all, you, you know, just give all me a call. Is call me, contact them. me through the website, contact yeah. me through, you know, Facebook, Twitter. It doesn't matter. I mean, uh, you know, all, yeah. all avenues of social media, they can find me. I mean, if you get out on, if, if a person gets out on my Facebook page, Marcel's Guide Service, you get out on a Facebook page, if, if somebody does not want to book a trip and you want to see what's going on on the lake, once the season starts, once I start going out there, I'll be posting pictures just about just about every day. I mean, we're going to yeah, catch fish yeah. every day. I'm going to re- post pictures unless something happens with my phone or something like that or a cameras or whatever. But, you know, there'll be pictures posted yeah. just about all the time. And I will tell, you know, mo- most of the times, if I tell, if it says in the, on my, you know, on my post what I caught it on, I promise you that's exactly what we caught them on. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't have to hide anything like that. It's, you know, I, I, I'm just too active on the lake. It's I can't hide anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, you talked about social media and taking photos. That's an interesting topic. I, I we, we always see people holding fish, you know, and I've seen it. People hold fish different ways. What is the proper way to hold a fish so you don't injure it when you're taking a photo? Well, well the, the big thing is, the big thing is you want to keep, you don't want to keep the fish out of the water no longer than you have to. But when you, you know when you're thumbing that fish, you know a lot of guys what they'll do is they'll clamp down on a jaw and then they'll twist it really hard. You know they'll tw- they'll twist their wrist really hard. You got it. You got it. You could put your you, you know you could hold them kind of limp, but you use your second hand to brace underneath the fish. If you break, if you got a big fish, a smaller one, you could get away with a little bit more, but those bigger fish, you got to remember, you know, they have their jaw and then the weight of the fish will, you know, too much weight going one way or the other is going to, you know, hurt the fish a little bit. I try to take care of them, baby them the best I can. The other thing is a lot of guys, and I'm, I have to admit, I'm guilty of this too somewhat, but I'm getting away from it. I would I, I highly recommend not live welling a bunch of fish during the summertime. You know, a lot of guys want to put their, you know, their four or five, six best fish in the box to get a big picture of all these big fish. When the water's cold, it's not, you know, you, the fish will be fine. Early in the season, you know, if you if you were allowed, you're not allowed, but if you were allowed, you know, you'd be okay. But once, you know, from the spawn into the hot of the summer. You know, you don't really want to box a bunch of fish unless that water temperature is, you know, at least in the low 70s. But once it starts getting to the mid 70s, you don't want fish in that live well for, you know, seven, eight hours. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, that's, uh, you don't want to hurt the fish. You want to be, make sure that they, they're they there to spawn and keep reproducing yeah. and doing their thing. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. taking care of the game. So, no, that's it, it a takes, great point. It, it takes a five pound bass about 15 years, at least about 15 years to get that size. That's a long, long time. Think about it. I mean, there are, there are only so many fish, five pounds or more in these lakes. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, if, if, you know, if, if a few go every year, you know, they start dying here and there, you know, you're going to have less and less. It's going to get tougher and tougher, but thank God, you know, like I said, our forage base is phenomenal. Um, you know, we have, you know, people are starting to pay attention to things a lot better. They're taking care of things. I think things are going to be better now. So I think we're all on the right path. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Yep. So, well, uh, good stuff. We're, we're getting here close to the end of the show. Uh, once again, I'll give you an opportunity to uh, let everybody know once again where they can get a hold of you so they can book a trip with you. Yep. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, you can call me on my cell phone, 810 923 5035. Or you could you could find me on social media at Marcel's Guide Service on Facebook, Marcel's Guide Service on Instagram or Twitter, and you could also um, find me through my website www.marcelsguideservice.com. All one word. Well, there you go, guys and gals. Get out there, get a trip booked, uh, get over here, and, and come into Michigan if you're out of state. Um, before we let you go, th- something just popped in my head. If if people are watching and they are out of state and you know they're not looking to come to Michigan, maybe they're in their home state, wherever that may be, and they're looking to book with a guide service. What's probably the most one or two important questions that they can ask a guide? You know, I, I think it's it's imperative to ask the guide. You know, if he's willing to teach, if the guide is willing to teach, then I think you're going to do do well with it. That means he's he's got confidence in what he's doing. You know, if if somebody does not want to teach you things, 
you know, if they're not willing to teach you a lot of stuff, they just want you to say, hey, you're just going to catch fish. You, I know you're going to catch them. I, that would throw up a red flag to me because that's a little bit of a sign of insecurity. So, you know, mm-hmm. I want to, I'd want to talk to the guys, see if he's going to teach me and let me know, you know, you know, show me the tactics that we're going to use on that particular day. I think that's a, a big thing. And I would go, you know, in, I would go in, I think, to social media, do a little bit of homework, see what past people say. I mean, don't get me wrong. Anybody out there, there could be one or two people that could badmouth somebody just because mm-hmm. they just dislike that guy. That could happen. We know, we know how that happens. But I mean, filter the. I would filter the two worst posts to the two best ones because it could be their best buddy telling everybody how great they are. <laughs> right. You know, fil- you know, filter a little bit from both ends and see what you know where the majority lie. If you find out where the majority lie, I think that's where, you know that's the type of guide you're going to have. That's great advice. Uh, I, anything else you got for him, Ken, before we let the wrap up the podcast portion? No, Marcel, I just wanted to say thanks, man. I appreciate it. We covered a lot. Of, I think we covered some good stuff here tonight, some informative stuff, and uh, I just think it was super cool of you to come on and, and talk to talk to us. And uh, can't thank you enough. I wish you uh, for a good season, and uh, and uh, I'll see you on the water. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, you know, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, everybody else out there, I hope everybody has a great fishing season. So stay in touch, guys. All right. That's right. going to do it for us here on the podcast portion. Uh, we'll wrap it up. And don't forget, uh, we'll be back again next week. Y'all take care. For those of you on the live stream, we'll hang on here for just a second, see if we have a last minute question. And if not, we'll. Uh, yeah, I just seen something here. Oh, we do have a question here before we let, let you go. Uh, Alec Winfrey just asked, favorite lakes or least favorite lakes around the country when you used to fish on tour? Uh, favorite lake, Thousand Islands, New York. Okay. <laughs> um, least favorite lake. Oh, God, that's least favorite lake. I think I'm going to have to say Kerr Reservoir or Bugs Island. They're the same lake, um, only because I struggled there. It probably wouldn't be my least favorite lake, but I've had too many times I've gotten beat up there in BFL regionals and stuff like that. And whenever I fished them at the Bassmaster Opens, I don't know what it was. That body of water always gave me trouble. But uh, favorite lake, I mean, favorite body of water probably, you know, of all time would be Thousand Islands, New York. It's got giant smallmouth, got lots of largemouth, has some of the best scenery in the, on the planet. I think that's probably one of my favorite places to go other than, you know, loving all the lakes in northern Michigan. Right. Does, does that play, I mean, you, you just mentioned scenery. Does that play a big part into just having an overall great experience when you're fishing on the tour? Oh, it, it de- I think it definitely does. I mean, you know, when you're, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes if you could be on a body of water that may, it looks fishy, the area around it looks really cool. You know, you see mountains, you see big boulders, you see cool grass, you see all kinds of stuff. I think you fish. I think you fish more with confidence. If you're in yeah. a flat lake, it's dirty water. It's you know, it just there's nothing there. Everything looks the same. You know, it, I, after about ten casts of doing, you know, not no strike, you start to say, I wonder if this next two miles are going to be like this. You know, it's just <laughs> it's just not the same. So, I know that well, yeah. it's kind of like even with hunting for me. I mean, if, if you've got great scenery around and you think it, yeah. it looks great, yeah, your confidence level does go up. I, I can understand that. I, I, that's, that's exactly how I am. Be, you know, being an avid hunter, I'm the same way. I, I love, I can sit in the woods. I have a, a you know, little bit, bit of a pine forest right here on my property, and I think I could sit there all day if I didn't see a deer. But, you know, I'm very fortunate deer come through the pine forest <laughs> there you go <laughs> makes it better yet <laughs> yeah it's always good to see a few deer filter through even if you're not going to take a shot oh, yeah. so <laughs> yep all right well, i'll tell you what we're going to wrap up the live stream if you'll hang on with us here just after we're done and then uh, we'll yep. talk real quick and let you go but uh, that'll do it for us this week folks uh, special saturday night edition we're going to re-release this on mother's day our mother's day episode so y'all take care and we will have a show tomorrow night for those of you who are watching we'll see you again next week All right, hang on one second, folks.